listeners and welcome back to a very special episode of Revival on the Air today. I interview Pastor John Coleman and his wife Janet, which I recorded back in 2018. It's special because they've touched the lives of so many people over the years, and even more so because our sister Janet recently fell asleep in the Lord at age 82 after a wonderful life serving the Lord. Pastor John and Janet's life story is really all about the history of the revival movement here in Australia. And their story starts in 1922 when Janet's father decided to move from Scotland to Sejuna in South Australia based on a coin toss. As a result of that coin toss, 97 years later, the word of God is alive and hundreds and thousands of lives have changed for the better. We've split their testimonies into episodes, each packed with amazing adventures, healings, miracles, overcoming challenges, and the history of the revival movement that grew from a small country town to a worldwide fellowship in over 35 countries. It's a great story. Enjoy. Pastor John and Janet, welcome to the Revival on the Air Today podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've had on my list of people that we need to have on the podcast uh, for a while, both of you, and I'm pretty excited to be here in your home today. You're this welcome. Is going to be, so really, the testimony of both of you really starts with, with Janet, doesn't it? It does, yes, but I'd like to tell the story of my, my father, who came out from Scotland uh, in 1922, when he was just 17, he had the opportunity to go to Canada or Australia. It was a government settlement thing for yep. boys, mainly because a lot of lads had been killed in the First World War and the farmers were looking for someone to come and work. And uh, he tossed a coin to yeah. see whether he'd go to South Australia or Canada. And South Australia won. Well, lucky for us, that coin toss went in our favour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he arrived. He arrived by boat. I think there was about a hundred boys on the boat that they brought out, and they sent him up to Sedona in another boat. And so he was working on a farm there, and that's where he met my mother. Quite a few years later. That's and a pretty rough thing to be put on a boat and then sent out to Sejuna. That must have been a bit of a shock for him, I imagine. Yeah. I think it was. It was all this acres and acres of wheat still then and scrub land to be cleared. And that's sort of what he was doing with an axe, working very hard. And he uh, he married my mother there and I was born in Sejuna. So that's where sort of Sejuna comes into it, and it does later also. I'm not going to ask you what year that was because that's that impolite. I can tell you it was 1936. <laughs> right, wow. So that makes me 81, 82 this year. And anyway, that that was that, and uh, we've shifted about. Dad was in the air force during the war, and we finished up Is in the Second Melbourne. World War. Yep, Second, Second World, World War. World War yeah. yeah, and we've finished up in. Uh, in Melbourne, as a result of that, sort of went there to live with the, with his sister. And that's another story. But anyway, then we shifted to a farm at uh, Barwon Heads, which was uh, outside Geelong. And neighbours, we used to notice quite often cars going up to the neighbours' place. Now, they had to go past our place to get there. And they had this week... Uh, one of the, I think it was a Thursday night. They, actually, what they were having was house meetings, but we, did, we didn't know that. And Dad went there to borrow something. Now, I don't know what he, what he was borrowing, some sort of plough or something, and a horse to pull it. And anyway, he, and while he was there, the, the lady of the house witnessed to him and told him what all these cars were about going up there, how they'd, uh, all of them had come to the Lord and they'd... And they received this experience and they were healed and there was all sorts of amazing things happened. And anyway, he came back and he was quite impressed with what she said because he was not a church... We were not church people by that time, thoroughly fed up with churches and uh, didn't, didn't uh, go at all. But anyway, he said, they're going to have another meeting next week. He said, and they said that I could come, but I'm not going. He said, you go, Janet. And find out what it's all about. And so, how know? old were you at this stage? Nineteen. Nineteen. Yes. So anyway, off we went. Lorraine and I—that's my sister. Yes. And we went to the meeting, and it was—I uh, was amazed because I had a Bible but didn't know what was in it. Mm. And that night, I found out some of it, 
And I, I was quite amazed. And I came home and I said, oh, this is really something really good. I was impressed with the people because they all said the same thing and they all had amazing testimonies of the, the experiences that they'd had. And anyway, the result of all that was that uh, about a month later, I received the Holy Spirit myself and I was baptised. They had used to have, uh, they didn't have their own hall. They had a little, uh, they hired a little country hall just up the road. That place was called Connawarri or something. And uh, they brought the baptism tank and the farmers round about brought hot water from their hot water services and the milk cans to put, the, put in the baptism tank. And I was baptised there. And there were about, I think there was about five or six others were baptised that, that night. Because wow. we were really in the midst of a revival, they were. They said to us, you are in a revival. What's a revival? <laughs> you know, so that was, uh, that was quite, quite amazing. And uh, I think in, a, in that country area, as a result of that lady, I know she witnessed to my dad, but she witnessed to a lot of other people. I think it was about 30 people over the yeah, right. 12 months came to the Lord. And... Uh, Oh, it was really quite, quite something, you know, amazing healings amongst the people and life-changing, that it was really good. And uh, anyway, and from then on, my mother, who who was actually the one, the connection from the Seduna place, yes. she wanted to go and tell all the relatives back there what had happened. We went all over South Australia. We went to Mount Gambia. We went to... There were people that lived in uh, Yundi. And, so these uh, were all relatives or people you they knew? They were all relatives yeah. of, of the mothers. Okay. Uncles and aunties and all the cousins and all the rest of it. And but, so she went on this big road trip to tell them all about her experience. Yeah, right. Wow. We went on a flying trip. A flying trip? What do you mean yeah. by a flying trip? <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a lot better than driving up to Sedona. But we went on a driving trip later. And anyway, that... that uh, we witnessed to all the relatives, and the amazing thing is that over the next 12 months, quite a few of them did come to the Lord. And this uh, cousin of mine, his name was John Borden, he came back from, I think you were at this, uh, uh, some youth thing yeah, with the Methodist right, Church, yeah. and he came back from that all full of this wonderful thing, and we said to him, you haven't received the Holy Spirit anyway. That's not what goes on at the Bible, you know, showed it to him. He was really wild to start with. He was very angry. He said that uh, he, uh, he had all this wonderful blessing and all the rest of it. And uh, he, we told him that it was nothing like that. And anyway, the next thing, he, we, he came to us, my mother and I, and said, how do you receive this Holy Spirit anyway? I said, well, you get down on your knees and you pray to the Lord and you say hallelujah and the Lord will... Billy was asking for it. And he did receive. Yeah, right. His cousin, yeah, that cousin knew John, because yeah, he was a, a seducer, young person with the Methodist Young People's Group and all the rest of it too. But anyway, with that, Mum and I had to come back and we wrote letters over the next year and uh, there were all sorts of things that happened. But then we went back. One of the brothers in Melbourne, who was quite a quite busy with evangelism, all little country towns and all the rest of it. I used to go with these people that did this. And I said, to, he said to me, let's go to Sedona and have a campaign. Oh, that sounded like a good idea. So, so uh, I, uh, I spoke to my mother, my father, and of course I, I forgot to say that Dad had actually been over to Sedona as well. As well, yeah. And they were amazed at his testimony because uh, he was uh, not a church person at all. but uh, So they would have seen the difference in him oh, too. They, yeah, he'd left one person, come back a different that's person. That's right, he yeah. did. And uh, he, he thought it was quite funny. He said, he said you, you won't believe this, he says, but the Bible says I'm a saint now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we don't believe it yet. <laughs> So anyway, that was all right. It was a very broad Scots accent right to the time he died. Yeah. You know, he said, he said, I'm a saint now. And anyway, but he he was most enthusiastic about us going. Mm. And I, I just, I just thinking one of the things I wrote down here is that we were very fortunate in our parents because, I mean, we'd received the Spirit, but our parents had as well. And they were, they were very enthusiastic about us as well, serving the Lord. Yeah. And uh, this chap, his name was Lynn Day, he said, uh, we'll go over there and have a campaign. 
And we wrote a letter to them. They hired the little, uh, I think it was the RSL Hall. RSL. Yeah, RSL Hall. And uh, so we went. This time we did drive. And uh, for Port Augusta, even then, for Port Augusta to Seduna, the last lap was dirt road. Mm. I think it was a bit of a shock to the fella that... Uh, that took, but took us, but never mind. We got that's there. That's a fair for those that <laughs> are listening that don't understand that. That's quite a long way, isn't it? Mm, it is. Yes, it's about it what? Well, well, from Geelong to Sejina must have been close on a thousand miles. Yeah, it was. Yes. So it was a big expedition that we went on. And anyway, we uh, got there, and the first meeting, the place was full. This little, this little. Uh, Little hall. A lot of them were so, relatives. So how did they know? Did they? You oh, they, they they put it in the local paper. Oh, did they write? Okay. Yeah, they yeah. advertised it. Yeah. And because uh, several of them had received the spirit at the meantime, a couple of my uncles and, okay. uh, and all sorts. You know, one of them anyway. Well, Don. Uncle Don and uh, Auntie Jean had gone over to check you out. I That's think. right. Yes. And uh, they got baptised. I yeah, think over did. there. Yeah. And uh, he'd received. I don't think she had. Uh, they knew about it. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, anyway, we had no music or anything. It was just a straight out, out, out of the scriptures and at them. And uh, a young fellow that you brought to the to the meeting, mm. he received, didn't he, that night? That's right. So you were there as well, Pastor John? Yes. That first meeting, uh, my testimony, of course, follows on from Janet's. And... Uh, I uh, had, had gone to this meeting. Actually, I, I didn't know much about this before. Uh, well, could go back a little bit. Uh, the first member of Janet's family I met was her father. He'd come over soon after he received the spirit and he came to visit my father because uh, they knew each other from before the war. And uh, I remember my dad saying, oh, this Neil McConaughey is going to come around and talk to me about religion. And so he was sort of ready for him. And we were down, Dad and I were down yarding some sheep and this Neil McConaughey turned up. I'd heard the name, but I didn't know him and didn't realise he'd be my father-in-law one day. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he came and Dad based. He said, look, I'm not interested. And was your dad a religious man? Uh, a little bit. He yeah, believed in God, believed in a supreme being, but he was not sort of what you'd call a dedicated Christian. He'd go to church once a month, that was enough for anybody, yeah. according to him. What did he say about his, his do, do good by the fellow if they're worth it or something? Yeah, he said, believe in a supreme being and do the right thing by your neighbour if he's worth it. Yeah. Uh, so that <laughs> intrigued me. But so that was the first contact. The next contact was because I knew this cousin of Janet's, Johnny Borden. He and I had been to this youth rally in Adelaide and we came back. Uh, I had gone away from the farm for uh, three weeks holiday and I went with John and another young man to this youth rally. We have all made our decision for Christ, signed the card and all that and got up there and then they just told us to go back to our church as, which is Billy Graham style of uh, yeah. evangelism but we were stirred up and we'd started this youth club in Sejuna after this uh, so uh, immediately of course John gets back to his home and Janet and her mum were there and he gets spirit filled and the next thing the town gossips are really <laughs> into it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, I remember going up to Sejuna with my mother and my young sister and uh, we were going to go and uh, go to the pictures but the town hall was full, it was school holidays and yep. a lot of people had come in from round about and they said, oh, there's not much room there. So I said, oh, I'll go and see Johnny Borden. And uh, Mum said, you're not going to see him? I said, Why? said, oh, he's, uh, he's become a religious maniac like his grandmother. <laughs> she was a notorious lady. And I said, really? I said, he seemed all right to me. She said, he's left the Methodist church. I said, oh, he must be mad. And so I didn't go to see him, just on what 
Mrs. Brown had told Mrs. Smith, who had been told by Mrs. Jones at yeah. the bowling green. Yeah. And so that's the way gossip goes, particularly in the country. And, and how big was Sejuna at this time? Was it uh, 800 people, people, I think. Okay. Yeah, so word gets around pretty quickly. Oh, yes, town of 800 yes, people. It's, it's, oh, he's stories, really stirred the place, hasn't he? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we think that a lot of the things, uh, you know, were told before they happened. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I stayed away from him. But one day I met him on the road. Uh, <clears throat> somebody's car had broken down, and to my amazement, he didn't have two heads. He wasn't uh, frothing at the mouth or anything like that. He seemed reasonably normal. And he turned 21, and I was invited to his 21st birthday party. And just was in uh, an uncle's house. And this uncle had been to Geelong, Uncle Don. And I remember Uncle Don, he was uh, a little black uh, beetle uh, Volkswagen. And he got me in a high squeaky voice. He said, they're speaking in tongues. It's right, you know. <laughs> What's speaking in tongues? I didn't know what he was talking about. And I get in there and there's supposed to be a 21st birthday party. And Johnny Borden gets his Bible out and showed me Mark 16. And that never happens in the Methodist church. And I looked at it and I thought, well... He'd want to pick up snakes anyway. That's how much I knew about it. So I didn't do anything. And you were going to the Methodist Church. Oh, yes. I you're... was up to me years in the Methodist Church. He was church. a lay preacher in the Methodist Church. Yes. And, and John... so you were in your early 20s as well? No, I was only 20. Yep. Yep. Fast forward to that night of the first meeting, and there was a... Uh, meeting. There was a church service at Mudamukla, which was where I was brought up on the farm, and the man who preached had been a Pentecostal pastor, but in the Apostolic Church. And I used to like his talks because he was spirit-filled, and he shouldn't have gone back to the Methodist Church, but he did. But he was spirit-filled, and so when he talked on faith, it was different to the Methodist ministers that we normally had. He obviously believed his Bible. Mm. And we got outside afterwards and he said, you're going to the revival tonight. Said, what revival? Oh, it's in the Sentinel, the West Coast Sentinel, published in Streaky Bay for all the world to see. And uh, so this lad that I worked with, he said, oh, I'd like to go. And uh, But he didn't have a car and I did. Well, can we go? I said, OK, but I'm going to go to my church first. And I went to the Methodist church. He went to the Anglican church. And we turned up at the RSL Hall at half past eight on a Sunday night. They, they clever, they waited until, until the church the people <laughs> came out. The other services were finished. And they all went up home to bed. <laughs> so we went to this meeting. And uh, um, I, had, um, I had two accessories at this meeting, which are not really all that compatible. One was a Bible and the other was a Methodist minister. <laughs> And uh, he didn't really believe the Bible literally at all. He used to spend a lot of time explaining away the miracles. Really? Wow. Uh, so anyway, he and I sat together in the meeting. Yes. And uh, it was very memorable because I was used to Methodist ministers who'd been trained in elocution and polite manners and how to hold your cup of tea and all those sort of things. And uh, this fellow, this Len Day, that uh, Janet had come across with Len and his wife, he was pretty rough. He'd been a, uh, he was a veteran of the Second World War. He'd been in the army. And um, he uh, uh, had this amazing testimony. He'd been healed of, um, uh, after a serious accident. He'd uh, invented his own speed car and back in the days when you didn't have to register things very well. And he made it wrong and developed lift when he went over a railway line out in the country and it wow. didn't have Rapper wings, so it didn't take off properly. Yeah. He probably didn't land very well either. No, <laughs> and he smashed his leg in eight different places wow. and finished up in traction in, for months in hospital. And when he tried to walk around, he used to get blackout turns. And he'd walked into, well, he had a, sh a business in Geelong, uh, auto electrical business. And there was a chap by the name of Jack Clay, who was a pastor in Geelong. He walked in and Len had a bad turn. And so Jack picked him up and witnessed to him. And uh, 
uh, Jack was had a good way of putting things. Uh, Len told him uh, what his problem was and how it was incurable. And, uh, and Jack said, I know just the guy to fix you up. <laughs> he said, who's that? He said, I was sick. I had tick dollar and uh, incurable, fix the main nerve in the face. And, and he said, God healed me. Well, Len told him what he thought of God in a not very polite manner. And Jack said, look, Len, you've got everything to gain and nothing to lose. Why don't you come along to a meeting? So he agreed. And he came along to a meeting and he got healed. Wow. Completely healed of this incurable uh, injury that he had. And uh, so, so much so that he was cleared uh, later on after he was in Port Lincoln to get a, a medical certificate to say he could fly an aeroplane. Right, and we wow. obviously believed him because both Janet and I at different times had been up in his aeroplane. There were times when we wondered about <laughs> <laughs> yes. He so, did some anyway. silly things. <laughs> but that had nothing to do with his leg, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But, uh, so he, uh, he, he preached on healing. I remember it very clearly. It was 60 years ago now. But he preached on healing and he went through many scriptures and they gave me a magazine when I came into the meeting and uh, I remember jotting the scriptures down down the margin on one side and there must have been 20 or 30 scriptures there and I started on the other side so he probably quoted 30 or 40 yeah. scriptures all about healing from yeah. Exodus uh, 15, I am the Lord that healeth thee right through to the miracles of Jesus and these signs will follow those that believe and all of these wonderful things. And they had testimonies, his own and, you know, Janet and different ones gave their testimony. And, uh, and all this time the Methodist minister is sitting next to me and then <coughs> we, uh, we finished up afterwards, a very memorable meeting for me because Roy, the lad that I'd uh, come in with, he uh, asked for prayer. And I thought, well, what are you praying for? You're, you're not sick. And he had warts all over his hands. And he asked for prayer for that. And I thought, oh, well, why would you need a miracle for something as simple as that? But a, a fortnight later, we were working together and, and he knocked one of them that came off and he went around and flicked them all off. They were all completely healed. Wow. But I didn't know that at the time. But he stayed behind and received the Holy Spirit. And I was outside of the hall talking to the pastor's wife, this Jane Day. And I remember saying to her, she asked me what I thought. And I said, well, it was interesting, but I said, you were brought up one way and I was brought up another. So let's just agree to differ and all be good Christian friends. Well, she wasn't prepared to leave it at that. And she said, well, it may be true that I was brought up one way and you another, but she said, it's not what you think or what I think, it's what God says that matters. But, well, nobody talked like that in the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. So, okay, and uh, so I started talking about Paul's thorn in the flesh and so on. And the next thing, the door burst open and Roy came out and he shouted out, praise the Lord, I've received the Holy Ghost. And my first reaction was to get him home and put him to bed. <laughs> <coughs> and, and on the way home, uh, my young sister had come with us as well, the only meeting she ever came to. So your, your sister? My young yep. sister. She was only 16. Um, but on the way home, he told us all about it. I said, what happened? He said, oh, I, uh, uh, w the man showed us some scriptures and we got down on our knees and we said hallelujah a few times and I spoke in tongues. And he was obviously very excited. So I decided, and I was in a room by myself, and I got down on the knees to say my prayers. And I said, God, if there's anything in this, can you give it to me? Because I was hungry for the blessing of God. Yeah. And so uh, I said a few hallelujahs. I thought, oh, this is silly. And I went to bed and tried to forget about it. And I can still remember the next day we'd had some summer rain. This was uh, end of December, 1957. And so um, I can remember ploughing around, going around and around, all these thoughts going around in my mind. And I thought, now what these people are saying is that if you uh, come along and you, uh, you say hallelujah and praise the Lord, that you'll speak in tongues. So I thought, oh, 
oh, check him out. I didn't trust this guy. I thought he was a charlatan. That's what the people in the district were starting to say. So I stayed to the meeting and uh, uh, I stayed behind afterwards and um, uh, I got down on my knees and uh, started quoting hymns because that's what Methodists do, they're great singers. So is this the following week, was it? Or? No, no, yeah, just two nights, nights later. Nights later. Nights they had a whole yeah. week of right. meetings. Every night. Yeah, yeah okay. Sunday through to yeah. Sunday. And, and Janet, do you remember yeah. Pastor oh, John yes. from the first meeting? Yes, yeah. I remember, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I was not quite like any other Methodist lady that he'd ever met, you know. <laughs> and I thought he was... I thought he was spiritually hopeless <laughs> being there with the Methodist minister. I mean, no hope for him. At that's all. right. Not at too, all. too churchy to get saved, according to them. <laughs> but God knows better than them. Indeed. Indeed. Don't than judge me. by the outward appearance. Indeed. So um, anyway, this night on the Tuesday night, New Year's Eve, 31st of December, 1957, and I after the meeting we got down to pray. And uh, Len was so rugged, he just said, well, uh, somebody said, look, it's a hard floor. And uh, so he went out in the back. This is the RSL hall, and it still smelt of beer from, <laughs> from the, some of their things that they'd had there. But he found a, an old rolled-up uh, carpet, and he brought it out. And he said, oh, the, the ladies, you can kneel on here. You guys can kneel on the floor. It'll do you good. This is a bit unusual for a reverend to be saying things like this. So I got down there and I sat bolt upright and put my, knee, my hands up underneath my chin and uh, and I thought, I'm supposed to praise the Lord. So I quoted the uh, the hymn, which was number one, the Methodist hymn book, was about tongues. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. And I knew all the verses, I quoted them, nothing happened. Started quoting another hymn. And, and the, the pastor came around and he said, why don't you praise the Lord? I thought I was. So he said, come on, say hallelujah. So away I went, I said a few hallelujahs, and, and I stopped. And he came and he said, what's the matter with you now? <laughs> Gee, they were pretty tough on you, weren't they? <laughs> That's right. I said, well, I can't say hallelujah, I'm getting tongue-tied. So he showed me Isaiah 28, with, with stammering lips and another tongue, and this is the rest, this is the refreshing. He said, I, I, I think you're close to receiving the Holy Spirit if you just pray a bit more. So I started to, and I felt the power of God well up inside of me, just like it describes in, in John chapter 7, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink, Jesus said, and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water and the spaking of the Spirit. And that's what happened. I burst forth speaking in tongues. They tell me I spoke in tongues continuously for about an hour. And they drew, just drew breath. I think I spoke in tongues, breathing in and breathing out. So, and and, did, what and did you he think? shouted at the tops of his voice, yeah. yes. And what did you think when that happened? Oh, it was just out of this world, absolutely, absolutely. And I just couldn't stop grinning. I was just, and I still am. Yeah, <laughs> 60 years <laughs> it, later. Just talking about a life-transforming experience, that was just uh, incredible because it's still there with me after 60 years. Mm. And, um, and, of course... Uh, uh, there was, there's others there uh, as well. Um, and another little interesting sidelight, there was another uncle and auntie of Janet's. Um, they were neighbours of us on the farm. The nearest neighbour was three miles away there. And um, Colin and, and Edna Ferguson. They, um, they had been witnessed to by Janet and, and the other cousin, there's Johnny Borden, and... I had gone to see them as a Methodist because they were sort of nominally Methodist and I talked them out of it. Talked them out of going to the meeting? Yeah, talk, because there was no meeting then. It was yep. just Janet and it had gone back to... Oh, okay, and yes. mother had gone back to Geelong. And I showed them what I thought was the thing in, in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 14 where um, I think it's... Says that uh, the tongues is um, like the little, the smallest member of the body, and so on, and 
and it's not really important. That was my interpretation of it. They were there the night I received the Holy Spirit, and they're waiting outside to see what... And what do you think of it now? Oh, fantastic. <laughs> they said, right, we're going to give ourselves a New Year present. We're coming back to tomorrow night to receive the Holy Spirit, and they did, uh, together with another uncle who uh, received the Spirit, and he, uh, he was a bad uh, diabetic, and God healed him of that. And uh, so... Also, uh, uh, the night I received the Spirit, uh, New Year's Eve, and so the next day, because I was the president of the Combined Methodist Anglican Youth Club, and so a very important position. <laughs> that sounds very uh, So I uh, said to them, look, we got this, all these young people coming down to the beach, uh, so why don't you come down and talk to them? And they said, oh, do you think we should? I said, well, I'm the president. I'm inviting <laughs> you. <laughs> <Where I want. laughs> so we went there, and so the Methodist minister and the Anglican minister both came. And I said, oh, by the way, I said, I went to the back, because he'd been with me on the Sunday night. I said, went back last night, and I received the Spirit and spoke in tongues. What did you want to do that for, he said. I said, that's the most amazing thing that's happened in my life. And I said, and I've invited them to come down. Oh, that was... I can imagine that would be, that would be very confronting for him. <laughs> yes, that's very right. Confronting. So I saw them going around. I remember talking to Janet and Joan and asked them about the pyramid. And they were drawing diagrams of the pyramid in the sand and, um, and and I looked up and the ministers were going around talking to the other young people. One of them was the lad I'd taken to this outing. And I said, what was Ozzy? There was Ozzy Oslins, his name, not Oslins, Ozzy Edwards. He, uh, uh, I said, what was he talking about? He said, oh, he was warning us to stay away. I said, that's terrible. I said, that was an amazing blessing from God. So I said, I'm going back again tonight. And the lad said, could he come too? And he did, and he received the Spirit. Yeah. So, um, but that night there was, uh, there was uproar at the meeting because the Methodist minister brought the Lutheran minister along who normally didn't get on because one believed the Bible literally and the other one didn't. And so, uh, when the, and so the Lutheran minister said that you wouldn't fellowship with the Methodists because you don't, you shouldn't be an un unequally yoked with unbelievers. <laughs> so we knew that this was said around the district. So Johnny Borden, uh, as they were leaving afterwards, they were they were actually interjecting. They weren't behaving like reverend gentlemen. They were sort of scoffing while Len was preaching. And so uh, as they left... Johnny Borden handed them a, a booklet or something and he said, I'm glad to see that you have broken the unequal yoke of unbelievers. You cheeky rascal, they said to him. I could hear him shouting at him. So uh, Len went out to intervene and he was getting a bit hot under the collar too. And uh, so there's, there's, there's a bit of an argument uh, going on. And I remember the Lutheran minister who considered himself to be a Greek scholar, he said, uh, Len said to him, have you been baptised? He said, I've been baptizo. And Len says, what's that? He said, that's Greek. Don't you know you're Greek? Never read a word of it, Len says. <laughs> so by this time, uh, Jane had appeared to sort of calm her husband down and she's pulling him back inside and the oh, sprinkling is good enough so I can still re recall Ben breaking away from her, Lovely. opening the door and shouting to them, get off home and get under your sprinklers. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and so where were you, Janet, this time? Had you gone oh, back? So I was in today. No, we were still there. <laughs> we were still <laughs> watching the, uh, the football match. And so anyway, I thought, oh, what do I do now? So, uh, Lord, I thought we were all friends. And so I'm praying, and while I'm praying, four people received the Holy Spirit. Wow. That was Janet's uncle, well, two uncles and an auntie, and this lad that I brought along. So um, anyway, then there were other meetings, and um, 
the next Sunday, I decided to get baptised together with this lad I worked with. And I kept looking in the Bible. I thought, now, this infant sprinkling, surely there's something in the Bible about that. And I kept looking, and I'm still looking, it's yeah. not there. <laughs> and um, so, but the more I read it, every time I opened my Bible, a scripture about baptism jumped out at me. I said, right, I've got to do what it says. So I came along to, uh, uh, on the Sunday morning, we went down to uh, uh, Decrees Bay, and there were... I think 11 of us were baptised in the sea. It wasn't and, a bad campaign. And, and two others were <laughs> baptised uh, a couple of days before because another cousin of Janet's was going back to West Australia. Went to the communion service, uh, first one that I'd been to and gifts operated and everything. And then uh, Johnny Borden, who'd gone back to the Methodist church after he'd received, it calmed down a bit. He said, I'm going up to resign. I said, uh, um, well, uh, uh, I, I am too. And no, that's right. He said, uh, I said, oh, I'm going up to resign. So I went up and told the Methodist minister. He said, oh, no, 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 stay there because... This was Johnny. No, no, the, the minister, I, I just went to see the minister. I said, I'm going to resign from the Methodist church because by this time I had become what they called a lay preacher. Yeah. We were studying theology by correspondence and church history and all that sort of thing. So I went to see him uh, and I said, I'm going to leave. And he said, oh, don't do that. He said, we can, together, we can bring the gifts of the Spirit into the Methodist church. And uh, I thought, oh, that sounds like an interesting challenge. I went back to the RSL hall, I told Len, and he said, you know what the Bible says? I said, what does the Bible say about? And he showed me 2 Timothy 3, in the last days, they'll have a form of godliness and deny the power thereof from such turn away. Mm. So I said, right, that's it. That's what I've got to do. And I did. Mm. And so it's been a good move. That was only a week or two after you'd received the Holy yeah, Spirit. One week. Yeah, one oh, week. Well, I received on the Tuesday night, and this was the next Sunday. Right, okay, wow. Five days later. Yep. I'd been baptised and left the Methodist Church, uh, but he uh, um, he said, I told John that he should, uh, when he was going up, I said, just tell him I'm definitely leaving, and he said, we won't accept it unless you're there in person. Mm. So we had a, a meeting with the minister, uh, the headmaster, who was a, a lay preacher, and another lad that used to go preaching with us, and uh, we had who this... Was that? Graham Millsby, he, oh, yeah, yeah. he was a school teacher. He never ever received. But um, so we had another robust discussion with the uh, uh, with the minister and uh, Johnny Borden and the headmaster and everything. But the the net result, we we left and we had a little meeting then. So that must have shocked the town. It oh did. yes. It so did. how far is Muddermuckler from Sejuna? Uh, about forty k's. Yeah. Okay. So yes. there must have been. But everybody knows Lots everybody of for 100 miles, really. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so we uh, based. Yes. It was quite a, quite a campaign. I can remember as people received the Spirit, we said to send a telegram yeah. home to, to, to Barwon Head to my parents, say, Auntie so-and-so. So for those that are listening that don't understand what a telegram is, because <laughs> there'll be <laughs> some, you it's might need to explain what a telegram is. <laughs> What is a telegram? <laughs> you just write it on a, on a form and, and they... Take it to the post office? Yes, you yeah. go into the post office, they give you a form. I know because I worked at the post office. <laughs> Jock used to actually work there as well. Um, and you write out what you want and you pay so much per word yes. and then they go and type it in and send it off. And, uh, and it goes to the post office at the other end and they that's print right. it out. Yeah, then they yeah. come around on a push bike yeah. and deliver the telegram. Yeah. I just thought we'd better put that in there for the younger That's listeners. Right. So yeah. they, were, they were getting these daily as to what was going on. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, so that was uh, quite exciting for them yes. and us, yes. So that was... Uh, and so, Janet, then how long did you stay in Sejuna? We went back soon after that because well, I was with Joan and Led. Yes. And they, they drove all the way back again. And, so, and I went back. I finished up with a job teaching where I could live at home with my parents because before that I'd been sent up the country and oh, all okay. sorts of things happened yep. to you. 
But I had a, a, a class, I think it was Ocean Grove, which is not that far away. I used to ride a bike there. I was very fit back in those days. It was a few miles, wasn't it? To, from yes, I think. But anyhow, many we worked out. So where's that from Barwon Heads to Ocean from Grove? Because that's sort of around the bay a little bit. Further, across the, the yeah, across Ac- the river. Yeah. Across the river. Yeah. The Barwon River flows out to sea. There's quite a big bridge there. Yeah. You have to ride across yeah. that. Where I nearly finished up in the sea there. Riding a bike across this old bridge with its loose timbers. Oh, right. The, uh, the wheel got caught in, in between a couple of them, tipped me off, and I can remember coming down, my uh, lunch basket and everything, the books and all went everywhere, and I was lying on my tummy looking down at the tide going out <laughs> underneath, you know, right away up high, you know. Had I gone under that 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 uh, the railing there yeah out of the railing because it was the middle of winter and nobody uh, nobody about yeah right uh, so that would have been the could have finished up with Harold Holt he got lost at sea on the other side, side. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cheviot Bay I think it was yeah. anyway. they yeah. never found him they never thought the Ruskies him. took no. him in a submarine and all sorts yes, of things didn't right. they yes. but anyway I, I picked up all this stuff and went on to work but that class that I had there was about the only one I'd never got victory over. Usually, you know, you sort of uh, get on all right with them. But um, I, I really was coming home one day, really praying and saying, look, Lord, I've got to get out of there. I said, it's just, 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 just not working. And I was going along. And when, when you went teaching, you signed a paper. You went, they put you through teacher's college, trained you, paid you money to, so you had something to live on back in those days. And um, but you had to sign a paper saying that if you didn't work three years for them, you paid it all back. Oh, right, OK. And I was thinking, I can't very well with that. I have to pay all that money and he won't be very happy. So as I went along, I thought, I did, the time's nearly up. I don't have to go. So that's when when I uh, uh, decided to resign. And I, I went to saw my parents and said, I'm going to finish there. I'm, not, I'm going to resign from that job. And I got to go out to South Australia and help Ben and Joan by, because by that time they had shifted. They didn't stay in Sedona. I think they would have been hung, drawn and caught yeah, if they had sure. stayed there. They went down to Port Lincoln. Okay. And uh, I was I'm going to Port Lincoln to help Ben and Joan. Oh, well, that's a good idea. You know, all right, that's okay, they said. So, so that's what I did. Because Janet... And, uh, being a teacher, she could run the Sunday school. Yes. And she learnt to play the piano accordion to supply music. Wow. Yes. One chorus at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and where are you at this stage, Pastor I'm John? still at Sejuna at that stage, but uh, Janet arrived where about September or something, something like that? Something like that. Yes. It, was, it must have been the... Yeah, it would have been just before the September holidays. Because, yes. So, but at the end of the year... Uh, I decided to uh, leave the farm and go out and preach the gospel. So how was that received at home? Because that's... Oh, it was devastating for my dad, mm. you know, because he was elderly. I mean, he was uh, he was 51 when I was born, so he must have been uh, 72 by this yeah. time. And even though I had an older brother, it was... If you're a farmer and you've got a lot of land, you... You've spent your whole life setting it up for your sons and then the youngest one decides that he he doesn't uh, want to be there anymore and it's, it's devastating. I can only imagine that. I mean, we, we obviously hear that a lot today, yeah. but back then, that wouldn't have been something that would have been that common, I imagine. No, no. Well, these days, of course, lots of people leave the land yeah. and go to the city, but in those days it was uh, not not so common. But, and it's a uh, big thing too, yeah. you know, and big inheritance, yes. etc. Yeah, that's right. But mm. uh, uh, nothing compared to the inheritance no. we've got now. Absolutely. So um, it, it was a hard thing to do. I knew it would break his heart, and I can still recall the day that uh, we were driving around and um, we were in the ute. We'd gone out to another property and he was driving around, we are checking up on the sheep and so on. I said, oh, Dad, there's something I, I've got to tell you. I've decided after harvest I'm going to leave and go and preach the gospel. And um, it was devastating for him. But strangely enough, it, it was partly something my mother had said. She said, 
John, you're trying to do two things. You're trying to be a farmer and to be involved with this new church that you're involved in. You can't do both. I thought, well, you're right. So I left the farm, which wasn't what she had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> She's probably hoping it went the other way. Yes. This is going to be a bit of a story. We've got a lot of years to cover. Amen. Episode one, episode two, and away we go. So uh, we'll see how we go. My own life has been majorly impacted because of their story and the decisions that they made and the direction that the Lord had for them. And I'm sure many of you listening will feel the same way I do. Stay tuned for the next episode. You can subscribe. It's free on all major podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and even on YouTube. We'd love to get your feedback, comments or ratings. Either do this in your favourite podcast app or send an email to podcast at revivalontheairtoday.com. Until the next episode, God bless. God bless.